Welcome to the Create Today podcast, where we share stories and strategies to help you create the life that you want, no matter what shit you've gone through. I'm your host, Karen Stanley, and today we have a very special guest. Her name is Angie Manson. And she's the CEO, she's many, many amazing things, but she's the CEO of Elevate Addiction Services, the only drug rehab in the country to have a CrossFit gym. Angie is passionate about health and fitness, and she's the host of the Going Rogue podcast, an excellent podcast you need to listen to, and a recent recipient of the Forbes Riley Outstanding Humanitarian Award. And with Angie's leadership, Elevate was nominated for, and won the Excellence in Treatment Gold Award from Conquer Addiction. Angie was also a contributor to the international number one bestseller, One Habit for Entrepreneurial Success, and has 27 years in recovery. Angie, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today with me. Ah, oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm like, I got to update that. I'm at 28 years. I'll, I'll be 29 this year. But yeah, I got to update that. <laughs> 29 years. That's insane. Yeah. Congratulations. And you're paying it forward every day and you're helping people every day. And it's so inspiring to me. And I want to share with my audience, how the hell did, you, what happened when you were 11? How did this all start? <laughs> this, this, you know, she's got this bio. She's like, yeah, I started using drugs and I was 11. What? 11? I know it Please seems so crazy it. too. I, yeah. I, I look at it the same way. Like uh, for me, it was always like, oh yeah, it's just what I did at 11. But like when I had my daughter reached 11, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so young. You're so, you're a child, you're a baby. Like I was really out doing all that stuff at that age. It, it, it blows my mind away. How, how did it start? How in the world do you, what, please tell us what happened? What was going so, on? All right. So going way back. So uh, yeah. my mom had me very young. She had me at 19 and I had no father. And back in the day, uh, we, she had to work one, usually two jobs. Uh, we didn't afford babysitting. So I was what they call a latchkey kid, which meant I was my responsibility to get myself to school, get myself home, sometimes make myself dinner, you know, be home by dark. There was just, it was very loose. We didn't have cell phones. There was no tracking. It was a very trust-based system. Uh, which was super cool. You know, I gained a lot of independence at a very young age. However, it also allowed me a lot of freedom and living in low income housing. I was surrounded by a lot of kids in similar situations. And it's kind of like that, that saying about the, the devil's hands, like we had all this free time with no oversight. And so we started first to start out with somebody stole some cigarettes. Oh, let's smoke some cigarettes on the hill. Then it became, oh, I, you know, took this bottle of wine from my mom's. Okay, let's try that. And we started sort of uh, progressively experimenting without any parental oversight. And uh, that's kind of how I got started. It, for me, I had already been exposed to drinking and drugs because I was around my aunt and uncle a lot who were only about 10 years older than me uh, because they were the last of the six, my mom being the first. And so I was watching them going, wow, they're the cool kids. That looks fun. I want to have fun. I'm going to be like the cool kids. And so I was already sort of grooming towards this is like a cool lifestyle I want to be a part of. Wow. What drugs were your aunt and uncle using? I, at the time, I didn't know, but what I figured out within the next four years and started doing with them was meth, but they were smoking weed. They were like doing uh, LSD. They were drinking. They were doing all this kind of stuff. And they, um, yeah, like I said, it just looked fun to me. I had no idea what half of it was, but I looked, looked like they were having a good time. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate because I had a really good uh, lower education. And so I was pretty smart. So I was able to sort of hide it from my mom for a while because I was able to maintain decent grades while barely even showing up at school. I know. You no, know, you weren't going to school. I mean, most days you didn't go or. Yeah. I mean, in middle it? school, it started to become more apparent. Like she would see the absentees. She would see the lates. And then once I hit high school, I immediately freshman year intercepted the first letter where you sign your, where she were to sign stuff off. And I used my signature. So my entire high school year, I, I would just intercept the mail before she got home and sign off on whatever they were trying to send to say that I wasn't doing what I should be doing. That's hilarious. My mom used to just tell me to sign it myself. So I just like, I've been signing for my mom my entire life too. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great way to, you know, and I think about, gosh, darn, I was, I was like smart, like look at that ingenuity to outdo the system so that I could have the life that I wanted. <laughs> I even dropped out my sophomore year, um, me and my best friend, and I enrolled myself in continuation school, which you had to do like a quarter of the effort and attendance, but get all A's. And I did that all on my own. And she didn't even know I had dropped out of my high school. She had no idea. <laughs> did you end up graduating that way with that continuing? Well, so then the next year I got through and I did all the, you know, the night classes. It wasn't night. It was like, I would just sit up at night and I was doing math. So I could sit up all night and just do the homework. And um, yeah, and I actually re-enrolled myself back to the normal high school in junior year. And by the time I got to senior year, I was pretty deep in my addiction. My best friend had uh, gotten pulled out and moved to a rehab in Santa Cruz because we were so bad together. I'd gone through my first rehab uh, at 16. My mom had been attempting to help me. I had been arrested seven times as a juvenile. So yeah, so by the time I was 18 and I was graduating, I actually didn't even know if I was getting a diploma. Like I was walking up to the stage because there was nothing was electronic back then. And so um, I literally didn't know if they were going to call my name or not. They actually did. And then when I looked at my credit, my report card, I had like a 1.67 Then they actually graduated me. But then I looked at the absences and the, and the, um, the tardiness and it was like, like, I wasn't even there. Like I, it's amazing. They even put me through, but, just, and that's the day I turned 18. So my mom was like, okay, bye. You're out. <laughs> I'm done with you. Yeah, I'm done. I did my due diligence. You're too much for me. You're an adult. Now you can leave. Was your mom, did, was your mom an addict as well? No, she was definitely not an addict. She was just very young when she had me. She had me straight out of high school. So it was really hard for her. And she wanted no association with my father. So she being, she's stubborn, you know, she's going to work two jobs. That way we don't rely on the system or the man. She was going to support us. Um, and, and it had to be hard because she literally didn't get any young adulthood. And then um, being single, she met my stepdad when I was like 13 and she got distracted and she was in love. And I was stoked because I'm like, yes, you go pay attention to him and I'm going to go do what I want over here. And, uh, you know, I being a smart little drug addict, I acted like I was really like upset over her, you know, not being my mom and bringing in this man. But the reality is I didn't care. I would just use that when she would try to put discipline in on me to get out of trouble. You are smart. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out young. I figured it out young. I'm yeah. not going to let my teenage daughter listen to this interview. <laughs> yeah, please don't. <laughs> I don't want to give her any ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, you're, you're in a different place than my mom and I'm sure your daughter's in a way different place than I was. So. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh my gosh. How what was your first rehab experience and why was it your first rehab experience? Do you think, why well, did it take multiple times or, or what, what, what happened? What, what do you think was broken? What links did you not have? Well, um, it was more like I got in trouble. So, um, I had been running away, uh, because I was drinking, using, I just wouldn't come home. You know, I'd put my mom through all kinds of stressful situations. I get arrested. So she put me in juvenile hall and then, uh, had them put me straight in a rehab. What didn't work. It was, I was young. I wasn't ready. I wasn't committed. I didn't even think I had a problem. I was 16 years old. And so going into this type of rehab, I was surrounded with other kids who were doing what I was doing, but even more so, which made me go, see, I'm not that bad. Um, and we were also local, like there were kids that were able to get drugs in. So we were still drinking, using and doing drugs as teenagers, not supervised well in this thing. So from there, um, I wasn't into any of it. I just learned how to manipulate the system, um, get the counselors to be on my side by playing the victim of what had happened to me and led up to this. And I met a boyfriend there who was not who was worse than I was. And so that's what I took out of it. And then that led me on a path that I went even worse than before rehab. Oh my gosh. What were you getting arrested for? Were you stealing? No. Oh yeah. 
<laughs> yes yes uh, well and curfew you know i'd stay out late at night it was reno so it's a 24-hour town and back then we had this thing called cruising where we would drive up and down and all the kids and everything would drive back and forth and just say like hey it was like this weird social thing um but i would stay out and i wouldn't go home and they would bust me for if we someone got pulled over for being out past curfew there was definitely stealing uh, when i ran away they arrested me for being incorrigible, which basically meant my parents couldn't handle me. So the jail was going to, yeah, all kinds of things. <laughs> I just got to know, what did you steal? What were you stealing? So I, this is uh, cartons of cigarettes. Like I, it was winter, right? So I would wear these big puffy coats in Reno. I could literally stick an entire carton of cigarettes up my sleeves. And this is back before they were locked up. Bottles of alcohol, same thing. So um, yeah, that was one of my busts. The most embarrassing one for me was when I was with my mom and I decided to steal some makeup. Uh, again, blaming her for us being poor. So I'm going to handle this myself. And as we were leaving the store, they busted me. And that was the worst one. That was terrible. Shit. But uh, yeah. So you you are the single-handedly the reason why they have cigarettes and alcohol behind <laughs> locked doors now absolutely no <laughs> doubt about it <laughs> yeah did you at least make money i mean did you at least sell no them? but we had cigarettes to smoke for a week at least oh my god <laughs> i was not good at that part i was not selling anything i just did it all it was very selfish <laughs> <laughs> i'm curious um your mom didn't want anything to do with your dad but did you did you find him or have any relationship with him I, I, I would ask her all the time. She gave me no information. I would be frustrated. Like, I just don't understand because she worked all the time. She was never at any of my school functions uh, because we were poor. I, I mean, there was just, you know, a myriad of like reasons why it just made me do the things I did, which were all just excuses, but I wanted information. She gave me none. And so uh, finally, she would just say, oh, he was some construction guy and he was an alcoholic. And that's where you get that from. And I'm like, oh. Oh, okay, cool. So I get this like gene from this dude that you won't even tell me who he is. Awesome. So now I'm just living with this, you know, whatever. And so um, many years have gone by and then I had my own kids and my kids were like, dude, you need to press grandma on who this guy is. You've got to track him down. Like, what if you have siblings? What if you have this? Because I'm an only child as well. And so my kids really pushed me on getting more information from my mom. And I finally got the full story and I got his name and I hired a private investigator and I did end up tracking him down about, gosh, what was that? Like eight years ago. Wow. What was it like? Did you? He never acknowledged me. Like I sent a letter. It went unacknowledged. I tried to call uh, the wife hung up on me. And so then I was like, okay, well, I see from this, he has two sons. So I sent both sons a letter no response. And then I figured out one of the sons was on Facebook. So I reached out to the son. I'm like, holy shit, this is like a sibling. And he was like, it was all news to him. He'd like never known any of this history about his dad or anything that happened. And so he was like very tentative with me, willing to engage, but I uh, was very one-sided. And so after me, like trying to force the situation, I finally just gave up. I was like, look, I'm not gonna, I don't need to waste my time on people who have zero interest in, in, them having interest in me. So I had right. to move on. Wow. I know, which furthers my abandonment issues, but no, it's okay. <laughs> it actually, it actually just increases my independence of like, you know, it's just, I just got to figure it out on my, by myself. Well, that's a good point you're making because that's a really another tragic. It's like, you never had him. You think you're going to find him. Then you have a loss again. It's still yeah. another tragedy and it's still another loss. And um, you know, it's one of the reasons why people that are adopted or like my husband was adopted. One of the mm -hmm. reasons why they don't even want to try to find their birth parent or like yours, you know, you, you want to find him because they don't want to find him because they don't want to be abandoned again. They've already been abandoned. Abandoned, so, rejected. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you don't I mean, want to put yourself out there. And that's why I didn't for all that time. Mm -hmm. My thought was always like, oh, I figure this guy will just finally acknowledge me in his will someday. And he better, you know, make up for that 18 years of child support that I was owed, you know, all the things that I didn't have because I didn't have him. And so it was always my thought, you know, maybe he'll finally acknowledge me on his deathbed. But now I'm like, no, he's been living this lie this entire time. There's no way he's going to go back now. Yeah. 
And so how did you wrap your, how did you wrap your brain around that and move on with that, with this attitude? Like what, how did you reframe that and go and move on with your life? I think it's because it's uh, always been this way that I was just like, it is what it is. I'd rather have people in my life of my choosing that aren't toxic than forcing people in there that either don't want to be there or are toxic. And, you know, running a drug rehab, counseling so many people, I've seen the damage of bad dads or, you know, fathers that are there, but not, or abusive fathers. And so, you know, I've learned to reframe that like void as, Hey, maybe there was nothing there, but it was better than having a really bad thing there that caused more damage. And so that's how I always look at it. Like I was probably better off by having nothing than something that was really bad for me. Wow. Amazing. So let's talk about your last stint, your own personal last stint in rehab. And the difference was how did you end up there? Did you go? I mean, are you voluntarily going, you're sending yourself or how did you get to your last one? So I had told you I was arrested uh, seven times as a juvenile. And so when I graduated and my mom kicked me out, I didn't necessarily quit all the bad things I was doing now that I'm an adult. It was like, okay, cool. Now I have zero oversight and I can do whatever the hell I want. And I uh, left Reno, came came to Santa Cruz where my best friend had gone to rehab, went back to Reno and I was, uh, I got a job and I met a bunch of people that were not doing good things. And that's why I was like, I got to get out of here. These, this is like, this is a bad path. So I went back to Reno, moved in with my grandma, got a job at a car rental place. And because after about six months, I've worked my ranks, I'm doing good. They, and I'm still doing like using, but I was maintaining my job. They let me rent my, uh, a car on cash because I worked there where typically, you know, you need, you need a credit card, you, you can collateral, whatever. They're like, well, you work here so you can, you know, take it. And I'm like, oh good. I'm going to go visit my friends in Santa Cruz just for the weekend. Got to Santa Cruz, started getting in trouble, hooking up with my old friends. Didn't want to go back, having too much fun. Now I got this car And I ended up uh, getting into, I actually drove this car off a cliff at one point. And I know, and I had just done some drugs and we were up in the mountains and I was able to like go hide in someone's house and the tow truck came and picked it out and gave me back my keys, like just crazy shit. And this all happened over a week, like over and over, you could tell. Uh, I just needed to be stopped. And there's some real crazy stories there. But ultimately what happened is I crashed a car. I didn't go back to my job and I ended up staying in Santa Cruz. So maybe a year later, (laughs) we're talking about this feeling. I was out with my friends, we were drinking and I was like, I'm hungry. And I'm like, I'm going to take this chicken. It was just like a a rotisserie chicken. Like, and I'm going to walk out the door and I go to walk out the door with the rotisserie chicken. And the security guard's like, really? You're stealing a chicken? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was hungry. (laughs) I'm drunk and hungry. I'm sorry. And so they called in my name and that's where I found out I had this warrant, which I had no idea I had. And it was, um, the car rental place had filed charges on me for stealing this car, even though they got it back. Uh, it was, and because I worked for them, it was considered embezzlement, which is a felony. That's because it's above $10,000, um, value. Plus it was stealing from an employer. So it was a pretty steep charge. So I was facing about 10 years in prison and um, yeah, so they arrested me, did a few days. My grandma bailed me out, went back to Reno, saw the judge. And so my, um, the public defender said, listen, Angie, you're facing a lot of time. So here's what we're going to say. You have a drug problem. You know, you need to check yourself in and you're going to do that. And I was like, I don't have a drug problem. What are you talking about? And I was probably super messed out when I was saying that he's like, okay, okay, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Let's just say you do, because this is better than prison. I'm like, yeah, but I don't have a drug problem. He's like, Angie, do you see the bigger picture? Do you want to go to rehab or do you want to go to prison for 10 years? I was like, oh, I get it. We'll just say I have a drug problem. Got it. And so I get, yeah, saying it. Yeah, so I get, pretend. yeah, we're pretending right now. And so I get, and I mean, I was only like 21 years old, but I get in front of the judge And, um, he, he hears the story and he said, okay, I agree. You know, you're young. I hate to see you get sucked into the system. Here's your sentence. You're going to go to rehab for a year. And then you're still on probation for three. And you have this $13,000 restitution for the car that you crashed to pay back in that amount of time. And I was like, 
okay, cool. I'm not going to prison. Okay. Shoot. What rehab is going to take me for a year? Like that is not the traditional length of a rehab, but I knew to go to the place where my best friend had gotten clean again. And it was in this guy's house up in Bonnie Doon where we lived. And, uh, that's where I ended up in rehab. So, um, I was the only client at the time. I couldn't afford his rehab. And so within a month, I started working to pay off the debt for even being able to stay there and doing the program. So I was going to say, who's paying for rehab for a year? You have to pay for it yourself. Right. Yeah. So my grandma was able to come up with what she could. And then I just had to start working it. And it was tricky because this rehab was local where I'd been getting in trouble. So it was so hard for me because all my friends are out partying and I'm stuck in this rehab and, but I'm trying to do the right thing. Cause I don't want to go to prison. And so it was really challenging. Like I really fought it. Like the first year I was not 100% like doing what I should be doing, but I, you know, he, he stuck with me and, and I, you know, eventually within that year started realizing I kind of liked liked helping people. Like after I got over my selfishness, I realized like my strength is, is being able to help people. And I found that sort of passion and purpose to help others. Hmm. What about your best friend? The one that you, that did the rehab and, and you were with all those years ago, how is she now? Oh, we still stay in touch. She's back in Carson city. I'm back here. We kind of flip flop all the time. And, um, yeah, we've, we're still besties. We've stayed in touch this entire time. That's so cool. Yeah. So you find your passion, you know, you're good at helping people. This is what you want to do now. What? So I go back to the judge and I have this really beautiful letter from my executive director saying, look, she's all this growth, these, you know, what she's learned, how she's helped, how, what she's done for herself. He's like, this is absolutely amazing. Good job. Now I need to see you every six months for the next two years to ensure that you're staying on this path and your monthly check-ins with probation, that sort of thing. And so I was like, shoot, what am I going to do? Like, I don't have anywhere to go anywhere to be. I don't trust that I could go back around those same people, uh, and do good. And I have this 10 years sort of hanging over my head. Like if I were to violate this in any way, a dirty test, another crime, you know, anything, they're going to impose that 10 years on me. And so I decided to stay put and keep doing what I was doing. And uh, yeah, which was, you know, it's not awful. I got a roof over my head. I've got uh, people I'm helping. I'm learning every position within the organization uh, because we were so small. I'm helping it grow. And, you know, it really, for me, I, we weren't making money, you know, back then, um, even though minimum wage was a thing, uh, we didn't really abide by it. And I didn't care if I had a roof over my head, some cigarettes, I was cool. So, you know, we're just doing it to do it and for me to stay out of trouble. So I continued going back every six months to see that judge. And every time I would bring this glowing letter and to the point, like you talked about with your mom, Andy would be like, ah, can you just write the letter and I'll sign it? And I'm like, okay. And so I would write these beautiful, amazing letters about myself. And I mean, I, I think it was all true. Like he signed off on it. He'd be glance over. He's like, okay, good. And then the judge would read the letter and he'd be like, wow, this is like the most amazing letter I've ever read. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that. And so you know, I, I mean, it wasn't hard on that. Yeah, it wasn't untrue, but you know, I, I knew how to make it sound real good. And so, you know, finally at the end of the three years, I actually brought Andy with me, the executive director. My grandpa came in the courtroom. My best friend was there. We're like all there at the end of the three years, like, okay, now what? And my public defender at that point said, Hey, Angie, you need to know that the um, prosecuting attorney is going to recommend another three years because you didn't make a dent in that. Uh, restitution, that $13,000 you were supposed to pay. You didn't do it. Even though you've done everything else right, that's still hanging out there. And I was like, another three years? Really? Holy crap. Okay. And so we go in front of the judge and the prosecutor says his piece about wanting to give me more time. And the, the judge looks at me and this is the same judge I've been seeing every six months for three years. He's seen my growth and progress and what I've done. And he turns and he looks at the prosecuting attorney and he says, you know, it's so rare. I actually get to see successes in this courtroom that 
I don't know what else you could possibly want from this woman. You know, you guys got paid that insurance money three years ago, you know, kind of like, how dare you? And then he swivels to me and he says, you know, Miss, I was Johnson back then. Not only am I going to wipe away your felony and clear your record, I'm taking away that restitution. You have earned this. You have a clean slate. Please keep doing what you're doing. Go out and crush life. Um, and at this point, I was like, like in shock, like, wait, what? Can this even happen? Do you have that power? And um, yeah, it's like getting a pardon. And so I'm like, I, I started crying and profusely thanking him. And he said, listen, you did the work. I didn't do the work. You did the work. You need to realize that and own that. And um, it was obviously a pivotal point in my life because I had rectified, I'd done it my time to rectify my past. And now I had a new beginning. So without that hanging over my head, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to do what I've learned to love now. And now I'm there because I want to be there. And I've been there ever since. So here I am, you know, 29 years later, I ended up taking over that business from the executive director because I was his, you know, I was like his daughter, but I was his right hand man and uh, taking it where we've taken it today. Wow. Now you're super big on fitness. And when you went there and he was running it, he was the executive director. Did they have fitness as part of the program? No, nope, that was not part of it. Um, you know, there there was different ass, uh, assets to it, but it wasn't what uh, I've made it. So when we, and and this was about nine years ago, we transitioned away from that parent company. And it was a nonprofit and I've been running it as their program that whole time. We decided, they wanted to make some changes. So we decided we're going to do our own company, our own rehab. And I had already been starting to do CrossFit at that time and finding fitness for the first time in my life, which was for me amazing because I hate, I was never in sports. I hated working out. Like I was not a fitness person. It was very forced. I had this heart condition. I didn't even know I had when I was younger. And so when I started like doing CrossFit and finding the, the fun and lifting weights and pushing myself and the camaraderie and how you have to be there for people. And by the way, you have to be 100% mindful because there's weights dropping and, you know, clocks going and coaches this, you have to be in the moment. And I found as, as an executive, there was peace in that for me because I couldn't let my mind worry about work. I only was in the present moment worrying about what was happening. So there were so many benefits from CrossFit where I was like, holy crap, this could so translate into rehab. Like I could see how we can make all this into part of a modality to help people get off drugs. And that's why I put the CrossFit gym in and it's part of what we do to help people get sober. Wow. Why, why do you think it's so pivotal or it's so crucial or, or it helps people be so much more successful and why CrossFit specifically and not just a gym and working out? Well, for me, CrossFit is, is a, it's a team sport. It's a community. So when people get in deep in addiction, they're pretty by themselves. They're closed off to the world. They're very solo. They're very selfish. CrossFit forces you to be out in part of a community as a group class. You're like in the trenches together. You like do hard workouts together. And then that helps you bond with other people. The people who are winning don't get the cheers. It's the people who are last where everybody's cheering. And this forces addicts to like be there for other people and not just be worrying about themselves. That's just one part of it. The other part, uh, like I talked about is the mindfulness. The other part is the endorphins. So a big part of our program that is different is today, the norm for rehab is you come in on one thing and you leave on eight different medications and they're calling you sober. Now you've just switched your heroin for eight different kinds of medications. So you're not really sober. You're just legally doing drugs now. And for us, we take everybody off everything before they even leave detox. They do their entire program completely drug-free. So we needed to find something that gets those endorphins, gets everything like moving normally again, rapidly. And a, a tough workout will get all of that stuff firing back correctly. The hormones, the feel good, the oxytocin, all that stuff gets firing right away. So they're able to sleep better right away. They're starting to feel good right away. And for me, like when I got sober, I put on a lot of very unhealthy weight. I'm smoking cigarettes. I got fat. I felt bad about myself. I just wanted to go back to the meth because, you know, at least I could control my looks. This is helping people not go through that unhealthy phase by getting sober, but by getting sober, they actually leave 
fit, looking good, feeling good. Now I'm motivated. Now I want to keep these wins. And they start to associate all those things together. And by the way, when I work out, it makes me feel as good as I used to feel when I did drugs. And so we give them enough time to start rewiring their brain to remember that pushing yourself hard physically creates that same sort of feeling that you can get from using drugs. Wow. What is the optimal amount of time that you're talking? You say you give them enough time. How much time is that? Yeah. So we have two different programs. We have our 30 day and we have our full program. I will always tell somebody go for the full program. That's like 66 days. That's enough time you need to rebuild a new habit. So I would always opt for the longer program. The more you can be, you know, in our environment, learning, as well as doing the physical, your foundation is going to be very big. Now, a lot of people can't be gone for two months. You know, they're like, I can be gone a month. I can't be gone too, or they can't pay for two months. So the 30 day is also very successful, but I think, you know, anytime, the more you can invest in it, the better you're going to be. The longer you do that. I did read that same thing. 66 days is the average. So some yeah. people, it will take 120 to create the habit. And then some people are good at 21. Yep. That whole adage that 21 days is, is all you need is not true. Oh, far from true. Like 21 days is not at yeah. all. Well, that's why I was talking to Andy about. That's why I think 75 hard is so life-changing because it forces 75 days of straight consistency, which, which is just above that 66 days um, where there's no cheats and you build that foundation. That's the key. You've just got to give yourself enough time without any cheats to build the foundation. Mm. And that's true of any habit that we're trying to change on, on ourselves. All you got to do is the consistency for enough days in a row where it actually is just, act, it ends up being a, the knee jerk, like the thing you do. That's just the habit. And that's where it's beautiful because it takes that, all that struggle and the mental and the, you know, uh, all the, you know, what is it called? The brain mental dancing that we do trying to get ourselves to do something that we want to, that we know we need to, but we don't necessarily want to, but we know sure. it's good. Well, and with overcoming addiction, it's like really important to replace one thing with another. So it used to be people would replace, you know, you take away the drugs and alcohol and they want to have sex. And so, you know, new in sobriety, that's not necessarily, especially with other people new in sobriety, that's not like good for long-term success. So that's mm -hmm. the other reason is you need to install a healthy habit to replace the bad habits that you were doing. That's brilliant. Is there anyone who comes to your facility that does not do the working out part, does not do cross CrossFit? Yeah, we definitely have people who opt for yoga, uh, which we have an amazing teacher. She teaches them the breathing, the mindfulness. It's not just like lay on the floor and stretch, like she makes them move throughout it. So there are definitely people who opt for that, who have injuries or they're scared, or maybe they did CrossFit for a few days and now they're super sore. So then they do yoga for a few days and then they go back to CrossFit. So we do offer those two as an option but that's it. Those are the options. Like exercise is mandatory with us. It's not an optional thing and it's supervised and it's in a class. So it's not left up to your own devices. Wow. Do you follow up like a year later or two years later from the people that were in your, in your um, rehab center? Yeah. Well, that was that whole award we won from conquer is they track our results. So they, they're an independent third-party company who tracks our results. They start with the people when they come into the program, they have like a weekly check-in. How is this being handled? How about, how's your, um, how's your anxiety and stress this week compared to last week? So they follow them through the program and then they continue to follow them for up to two years after they leave. So those are how we won the, the award was based off results of long-term sobriety after completing the program. We also have alumni groups. We have virtual outpatient. We have many ways that we stay in contact with everybody. Wow. Which is the reason why they remain successful. I think there's a lot of reasons. What else do you think? What are the reasons why your, your program is so successful and others are not? Because it's actually a program. So uh, again, other programs are more like uh, come in, replace the medications that you were on, come to a meeting, find a sponsor, do the work or don't. Oh, your insurance quit paying. Bye. 
they're not actually even programs. They're not a program. There's no structure. There's no discipline. There's no um, requirements. We have a copyrighted curriculum for phases that they go through. They, you know, work through their issues. They handle their trauma. They work with a one-on-one -on -one counselor. They have their groups. They have their experiential. We have music therapy. We attack it from so many different directions. And it's an actual program with an actual graduation with a certificate. Like you did all the things to get here. Whereas that's not what normal programs are doing. And it's unfortunate because people aren't getting the help that they need. Wow. I was just curious because here in Arizona, they're using a lot of equine therapy with yeah. the rehab centers. Do you have horses? Oh, I wish. I wish someday that is definitely a bucket list of mine, not, not even a bucket list. It's more like, you know, when we get to our next phase, I definitely want to incorporate animal therapy because I feel like the benefits are amazing. Mm. We have a couple cats at the center. I bring my dogs up, but I think if we were able to, you know, incorporate horses and that sort of thing, that would be amazing. I have heard amazing things from it or about it. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about the next phase. I want to hear more about your next phase. <laughs> yeah. So the next phase is, uh, you know, the, the constant phase is, uh, you know, keeping people coming in. So as you can imagine, when you have people coming for 30 days, 60 days, there's a constant churn and we have, and, and we don't build our business on return customers. Like we, our hope is you come and we never see you again. Of course, if you need our help, we're here but we don't build our business on return customers, which again is like uh, some of the other rehabs. That's how, that's what they rely on. Like, oh, I hope you go use so you can come back and we can build your insurance higher because you're addicted again. Like we don't like, we don't like to play that. But with that brings challenges of constantly finding people that um, are qualified for our program, their insurance will cover, or they have private funding. We're not state funded. And so, you know, really the biggest challenge for me is to keep my beds full so that we can then expand into other states and other sectors. And my big one, one thing that um, we realized, and this was again from these awesome outcome studies that we do, which by the way, most rehabs don't do, which they should all be held accountable to, but they don't. But in our, in our process of the outcome studies, they would send us reports and every addict, 99.9% .9 of addicts or alcoholics coming into treatment are presenting with depression and anxiety. Obviously you're strung out, you burn bridges, you don't feel good. Everybody has depression and anxiety. If you're addicted to drugs, it is what it is. So mm -hmm. we noticed as the people were progressing through the program and by the time they were leaving, 99% of the people that presented with it didn't have depression and anxiety anymore. It was no longer a factor because they'd done so much work on themselves. They've added exercise in, we're doing mindfulness, we're handling trauma, we're doing this, we're doing that. And I was like, we could make a huge difference in the mental health field, which has gotten so much worse since the pandemic, mm -hmm. but we could actually start helping people who are not presenting with drug and alcohol addiction, but more like mental uh, trauma or stress or that sort of thing. And, you know, tweak our curriculum a bit and help that type of people as well. So that is like, I feel like really big and really needed and where I want to go to next. Oh my gosh. That's so wonderful. You're right. It is. A, it's an epidemic. I think that is the real pandemic is just depression and anxiety and so much uncertainty um, that everybody can kind of feel. I think everybody can kind of feel this. And we know people that are really struggling and suicide rates are through the roof. And it just, it just really hurts my heart. And that is amazing that you are, that's your, what your next goal is and your next, um, uh, you know, challenge to tackle because it's such a huge need. It is. And, and so much of it can be handled, not with medication, not with more medication, not with medications to handle those side effects. It's health and nutrition. It's what are you putting into your body? What is your, what is your body deficient of? Are you moving your body? Are you getting sunshine? Like, I mean, it seems like very basic, but just like fine to, and this goes for kids, for anybody, just really getting on top of your health and your fitness handles so many of these problems. Wow. Yeah. Like Brendan Burchard said, he said, common sense is not necessarily common practice. Right. I think about right. that all the time. It's common sense. Everybody knows you have to get sunshine to get your vitamin D, to be happy and to get a five minute break, whatever. It seems like everybody knows that, but how many people actually do it? 
you know? Right. Um, right. And again, since the pandemic way less because we were conditioned mm -hmm. to stay in your house. Don't leave. Don't be around people. Don't, you know, the, the health food stores are all closed. The gyms are closed, but you can eat Walmart and McDonald's. That's okay. Or in mm -hmm. fact, just have it delivered to your house. So you don't even have to leave. And it just created what was already, you know, not the healthiest of countries and even more unhealthy country, because when you've been conditioned to do that for two years is very difficult to just snap your fingers and say, Oh, I'm just going to go back to the way I used to be. Like, you know, we talked about a habit being 66 days, talk about two years of being that way. Very difficult to reverse that without, you know, guidance, help, support groups, knowledge, motivation, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You mentioned right out of the get-go, how CrossFit is the first thing that came to your mind was its community. Yeah. How important is that one aspect in recovery or in recovery from anything, from trauma, from depression, from anxiety? I think it's huge. Like I, I could be having the worst day. I could go in the gym. I'm not talking to anybody. Everybody starts joking around. I'm lifting heavy weights. I'm like, oh, you're doing good. Okay. No, I'm just, you know, going to work through this, but it, it, it teaches you to be there for each other where it's bigger, it's funner, it's better. Like I'm a huge social person. So for me, the community aspect came very easily for others. It's a learned thing, but there's so much power in that. And like at my graduations, every Friday night, every client who gets either, you know, a phase completion or a whole graduation completion, they say the biggest thing for them was the community inside mm -hmm. the gym and also inside the residential rehab. And you're not going to get that by, you know, globo gymming by yourself over there. Now it's good for your fitness. I'm going to say, I'm never going to say, don't do that. You absolutely should. But also when you can involve community, there's just so much more power behind it. And that tells you how important it is. I mean, just that statement, if you hear that statement over and over and over again, that's just, and, and, and when we're not in rehab, anybody who's not currently in a rehab you know, facility today, yeah. it's still true, yeah. right? Oh, it's vital. I mean, you got to be, and, and it helps hold you accountable. You know, you don't want to not show up because your friends will be like, where were you? <laughs> oh, I just decided to press the snooze button. It's like, it starts to create this built-in accountability as well. And that's why I really wanted to push um, CrossFit because, you know, we're not AA or NA based. So when they go back to their town, well, what do they have until I get elevate meetings in every town? Right now, we've got to create sort of an artificial community. Well, CrossFit is great for that because it builds in the accountability. It makes them feel good. They have a place of to go with like-minded, healthy-minded people automatically wherever they live. I love that. So you're sending them out to wherever they go back to and they don't, my, they, they're leaving your community, but you can send them into another community and they can keep up all their good habits that help them recover. Right, because odds are, the people that they're, if they're going back to the same town and the same place, they don't know a lot of sober people. They don't know their community are the people that are not doing good. Again, we need a replacement community for that because we don't want them to sit at home by themselves either. So they've got to be in a productive environment that pushes and helps them stay and maintain all the gains that they got. You know, if you put yourself back in, you know, I'm just going to go to the bar because I need to be around people, but I'm not going to drink. You do that often enough. You're going to end up like, oh, I could have one, I could do this, I could do that. So we really need to surround ourselves with people that are also doing well. Oh, I love that so much. For anybody who has a loved one that's struggling um, with any kind of addiction, we'll leave all of your information, obviously, in the notes. But somebody who's not actively um, using or actively, quote, addicted to something, but just really struggling, what kind of advice would you give them? I would say seek help. Like don't, don't struggle alone. Um, whether it's finding like a, a mastermind group or a, um, you know, some kind of support group or a friend or a counselor or a mentor. Like I found mentors um, and he's like a coach. Like I found one that was good for me um, because I didn't think I needed like a therapist, but I needed somebody to help hold me accountable or let me talk about my day. Am I looking at this right? Or what do you think about this? Like finding someone that you can trust that can give you advice, make you not alone and help guide you on where you need to go and what you need to do. Yeah, that's really good advice. I love it. 
Yeah. I mean, it's why we're in our group, like, you know, women in business and Arate, because, you know, we're immersed around like-minded individuals that are helping us with ideas. You're not alone. Here's your group, reach out. Just being part of groups, I think is huge. That's true. Especially I think for, not especially, everybody needs to be a part of a community, everybody. Yeah. And if you, the one that we're in, we're talking about is called Arate. It's for entrepreneurs um, because we can feel, we sometimes could feel like that we're the only ones struggling with the things that are maybe perhaps unique to people that own businesses because not everybody owns a business. So everybody else that maybe have a job or a W-2 or they're an employee or they work for somebody else, they don't, they don't have the same issues. They're, they have issues. They're just not the same ones. And so if you find somebody who has some, you know, or uh, the, not only the same issues, but maybe is a couple of years down the road from you in whatever it is. Right. So that would be true for recovery or somebody who has actually had depression and they feel better now and they had anxiety. Maybe you could find somebody that is for just further down the road, a couple of years You go, okay, how did you do that? Find out what the strategies and the tactics and and just by talking about it, you feel like you're you're not alone. You're not the only one dealing with these certain types of issues, right? Absolutely. And I would say that's one of the, the plus points that came out of the pandemic is the availability to different kinds of groups. Because, you know, prior to that, it was like in person or nothing. Now we have means of connecting with people all over the United States, very specified to what we need and what we want. And so I think that's been extremely powerful to, to find the group that's your tribe. Like, you know, that that's like the terminology, like find your tribe. And it was interesting because prior to Arate, like you mentioned, I felt like I was an island. You know, I can't dump all the stuff on my employees. They're looking to me to be confident and, you know, know what I'm doing. Yeah. And then I didn't know other business owners uh, in a similar field at all, or even in the same kind of just place where I was in my business. And it was finding Arate, that first group that gave me that support, that understanding that you're not alone, the like-minded people. I have so many friendships like you that I've built from that group that are true friends because I got in the right tribe. It's so important and so special. I feel the same way. And every time, I don't know if you have this experience, if you have someone new that joins or you, or you come to a, a, you know, an event that you haven't met before, but they just joined. I was like, oh my gosh, I always thought I was the only one. Well, that's true of anything. So just because we happen to be entrepreneurs and we happen to find the tribe of entrepreneurs where we, you know, actually build true friendships and we build that tribe, doesn't, there's tribes everywhere, just like to your point. And they could be on Zoom and they're on Facebook and whatever it is, whatever you're struggling with, there's definitely a community and it just takes a couple of clicks and a couple of phone calls. And, you know, you could be just one phone call away or one click away from finding the people that, that will help, you know, you the most. Sure. And I would just add to that and say, you know, you don't have to force it if it doesn't feel right. Like I was in an entrepreneur uh, community for a couple of years and, and cause I felt like, okay, I needed this group. And, um, you know, I'd seen other people really enjoy the, their little, you know, pods of groups inside this bigger entrepreneur organization. And I was trying to force something that was making me feel, and this wasn't anybody in it, but it's how I felt. I didn't have the degrees. I hadn't sold my business. I wasn't at their stature. I didn't have my master's. Like I always felt less than, even though I almost had more employees than everybody else, but there was just a certain feeling that I would get when I would lead them that wasn't necessarily helping me. So although I was, uh, wasn't alone, it also wasn't giving me that confidence that what I was doing was right either. And so that's why I also think it's really important to find your right tribe where it all clicks because it does exist. It is out there. It just takes, it takes time to find it and just don't force something that's not working for you because it could end up making things worse for you and not better. So glad you said that. Yeah. Don't give up if the very first community or very first tribe or very first thing you try is not perfect for you because it, it just keep, just try another one. I'm so glad yeah. you said that. Um, how old are your kids now? So my daughter is 23 and my son is 20. He'll be 21 in two weeks. I know. Wow. Yeah. So he's, he's at Baylor and, um, I, I have another entrepreneur group that spawned off of the, our group that I go out to once a month. And I joined it because it puts me in Texas once a month so that I can go and pose 
myself on him in his college years because last year I realized, oh my gosh, he was all the way through his sophomore year. I hadn't even visited him once. And he's totally cool with that. Like he's independent, doing his own thing in his fraternity, working hard with school. Uh, it's at Baylor. It's a, you know, he, a lot of learning. He's very spent. So he was fine with me not coming, but as a mom, I'm like, you know, I can't get these years back and I need to be part of this. And so uh, I'm going to go see him uh, in a couple of weeks and, you know, take him out to eat for his birthday and stuff like that. Oh, that sounds great. Uh, Baylor's a great school. I almost went there actually. I'm from Texas. I think I told you that. Um, oh yeah. I was this close to going to Baylor. It's a really good school. So it's excellent. a great school. And, and what he loved about it, it was the culture. It was the community. Like, you know, obviously they have great academics, but they have amazing sports teams. The spirit, like when we visited all the different schools, their spirit was like bar none the best. It was so fun. And it just checked all the boxes for him. And he's kind of social like me. And, he, and, and it was important for him to find his right tribe. And it's interesting because like his best friend ended up going to uh, a different school, not far away from Baylor because he felt obligated because his family had gone there, but it didn't give him that same spark. And his college experience has been so different than my son's college experience, even though they're both very similar people. And I know had he gone with Logan, they would have had the best time ever. But now he's like, I can't wait to get out of here. So again, it really is finding and listening to what is your tribe that's going to make you your best person, as opposed to forcing things out of obligation or otherwise. Yeah. And doing things just because someone else expected you to do it. And it's, right. it's so much family pressure sometimes around, especially around college oh, for whatever gosh. reason, you know, yeah. a lot of people, just, they just, they have to have their kids go to the same college and, um, yeah, I wish everyone would just relax on that one. <laughs> just... Well, yeah, because, you know, like anybody, <laughs> when something's forced on you, you're not going to enjoy it as much as if it's your own choosing. Okay. And that's like our modality at Elevate. We don't force anything on anybody. We give them the tools to figure it out for themselves. And then they have the aha moment. And then it sticks like me saying, this is your problem. This is what you should do. I know I'm the professional. I, I can like tell you what it is. Nobody responds to that. Maybe a few people do because they're like, oh, thank you. I always wondered. But most people are like, okay. I mean, you know, it just doesn't resonate. But if you just give people the tools to figure it out and they figure it out for themselves, it, it impinges way better. I love that. Is your daughter involved in the business with you? No, no, she has a zero interest. You know, you always hope that your kids want to follow in your path. My kids, because this has been such a big part of their entire lives, they, they want no part of it. Um, they, they see the hard work and the heartache and they're supportive, but no, she's 23, but she's very old fashioned. Like she just wants to get married and have babies and take care of the house. And like, she is just like old school. We are like a hundred percent opposites, which was very hard. Interesting. I mean, it was hard, but uh, raising somebody who's not like you, because I'm like, just work, just get a job. You could do both. You, you know, be tough, like work through this. And she was very like sort of soft and emotional and sensitive. And I'm like, oh my God, how do I deal with this? I don't know how to deal with this. So it's, it's been interesting. I don't know if that's harder or easier. I mean, who's to say, right. If someone's just like that, you still, oh my gosh, you're like, you're exactly like me. So you're still going to butt heads. Oh, that might be true. You might be true on that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Oh man. And this it's is... also just a mother daughter thing, right. You know, like I wanted to be exact opposite of my mom. So she probably wants to be exact opposite of me. And it's like, I, I can understand that as well. You know, and no matter what we want, we end up a little bit like both of our parents, no matter what, anyway. So, <laughs> yep. So just suck it up. <laughs> All right, sis. You're yeah. stuck. Oh, yeah. love it. oh, my gosh. I can't thank you enough. This has been wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. And thank you for everything you're doing in the world. You are such an inspiration. Um, tell people how they can find you. So if they need help, I would suggest going to my website, elevaterehab.org. There's a, a chat bot. If you need to be anonymous, there's phone numbers. If you need to call, we're available 24 seven. Even if we're not able to help you, we will direct you to the right place that can. Um, if you want to reach me directly, I would go to my IG, uh, going rogue podcast. I guess it's not a .com if it's a uh, IG. It's going rogue po podcast. There's like an underscore in there. You'll find me. And yeah. then, or Facebook, Angie Manson. So any of those places, just reach out. I'm here to help. Um, whatever I can do to help someone else. You know, it's 
in my opinion, if, if I can help one person that helps five people around them, because that's how many people we're usually intimately connected with. So the more people that I can help, it's going to exponentially help the world more and more and more. So, you know, reach out, let me help you so we can help others. I love that. And that's true of everybody. If you help one person, that's a really good thing to remember. Then you're helping at least five and probably more. Right. Yeah. The rose of influence. It's crazy. And, you know, you don't have to suffer alone is the other thing. And the other point that I would make is check on people. If you're worried about them, ask questions, be nosy, be imposing, be irritating. I'd much rather have somebody be irritated with me because I'm seeing things that don't look right and I'm trying to get them help than be like, oh, they got this and then something happened to them and I live with the regret the rest of my life that I saw something, but I didn't want to step on toes and I did nothing. So I would always say like, if you, you see somebody that you think is struggling, reach out and try to help them get the help they need. Mm. A lot of people won't ask for help. They don't want to impose on others. Maybe they don't think they need it, but we see things and it's, it's our duty in my mind to help those people. Yeah. Go with your gut. I yeah. think a lot of times we, we don't want to believe what our gut is telling us. Yeah. When you see something and your gut is telling you, there's probably something wrong with your friend or your colleague or your coworker, or is probably, they probably need help. And you're right. I'm not going to ask for it. Most people just, they won't, they think they can do it themselves. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, even I, many years into doing what I did, I was that person. I was like, well, they look a little off. Oh, it was probably because they didn't sleep good. And I think it was because they worked long. You know, I would come up with all these excuses and talk myself out of when I was seeing something that didn't look right. So it's very natural for us to, at least, you know, for most of us to want to make sure, you know, think that they're okay for them, see the best in people, believe the best in people, not, not believe what we're seeing, doubt our own intuition. And that's why it's important to just, you know, go there. How do they react? Do they get super offended? Then there might be something there. So, you know, be willing to step on toes and upset people if it's saving a life. Oh, I love that. Angie, thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate you. And, um, Thank you everyone for listening and thank you for being here and supporting my show. I love you. Remember the only way to create the life that you want is one day at a time. So just create today and God bless you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.